Hi, good day. This is Aldu and this is Horia. Welcome to the Focus podcast. Today we have the honor of hosting Linda Rising. I met her uh, recently again at the Agile 22 event in Nashville, Tennessee, and Linda has graciously agreed to join us on the podcast. So to start with, Linda, we'd like to ask you, share with us a little bit about your river of life, please. Oh my goodness, that, you know that I just turned 80. And so it, we could use up all of the time <laughs> talking about what I've seen and where I've been. And so we certainly don't want to do that. Maybe we Why should not? Just... <laughs> <laughs> oh, it would be boring. It would be boring. So maybe we should just concentrate being, being agile on a little bit toward the end. And we might start, say, in the mid 90s which is when I began my Agile journey. And at that time, I was thinking about patterns and I began writing a book called Fearless Change. So that took 10 years of my life. So Fearless Change was not published until 2005. I wrote it with my very good friend, Mary Lynn Manns, who also loves patterns and loves Agile and we work well together. So we wrote a second book, a follow-on, which also took 10 years. So when people ask me, Linda, we all read books. Books are important. What's the book that changed your life? I have to answer by saying, it's the two books I wrote. <laughs> because in that 20 years, I learned so much. I had certain expectations at the beginning and over those 20 years, I completely changed. I am not the same person I was when I started. What I believed about organizations, about how people think, about how they make decisions, how they solve problems has completely 180, a complete turnaround. And since that time, that's what I try to do to share that experience. Because what I believe is that most people maybe are where I was in 1995 and they need to share remotely at least what I've learned. Mm. That sounds awesome. So. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, what inspired you to, to write the book? Well, I, I, at the time was a technical person. I'm a PhD in computer science and I thought patterns were about technical things. And I was trying experiments of various kinds. I wanted other people in my organization. I was working for a, a telecom company at the time. And I was trying to introduce a new idea. And patterns were about design. They were about user interface. They were pretty technical. And I thought, I wonder if I could go meta. Could I write patterns for introducing patterns? Could I get other people interested in what I thought was a great idea? And wouldn't that be a technical book? And couldn't there be patterns for that? And that got me going. And of course, then the journey turned out to be 20 years long. And I learned over that time that it's not a technical, not a technical pattern at all. Mm. These are about things that I didn't understand. These are about how people behave, how they behave as individuals, how they behave as groups. And so it started me on a journey that I did not expect. Let's talk a little bit about more and more of, of that. Uh, it's more about people. Um, what were the major aspects uh, around it's all about people? Well, I guess the first one is that we all believe that we are rational decision makers, we're logical thinkers, especially those of us who are smart. And mm. I know you two are smart, 
And of course, I know I'm very smart. And the people who are listening to this podcast, they are also smart people. And so we believe because we're smart, that we are rational, we're logical, we look at the evidence, that's how we make decisions. And since we believe that about ourselves, we believe that about others, the people we work with, our colleagues, maybe even members of our family. And so if we want to influence them, if we want to convince them, if we want to reach out and cooperate and work with them, well, then we do some sort of a logical exercise. So we explain it. We have a little PowerPoint presentation where we outline the benefits. And in our logical approach, we think that others should be convinced, should buy into it. And when they don't, then we're not only disappointed in them, but we think they're stupid. <laughs> so what's wrong with these people? I tried, I tried, since I know how this happens, I tried to explain it. I tried to show them the benefits of doing things my way and they weren't convinced at all. So therefore, ergo, since we are also logical, therefore they must not be as smart as I thought. So now, not only am I disappointed because they didn't want to go along with my idea or they didn't really want to listen to me, but I'm disappointed in them as people thinking, oh my goodness, what's wrong? What's wrong with those people? And this plays out not just on teams, on organizations, but in the United States, which is where I live, so it's the only country I can speak to right now, we suffer from enormous polarization. Mm -hmm. And it rests on that foundation that I try to talk to you. I logically try to explain to you how I'm thinking and you just don't get it. So therefore, there must be something wrong with you. So that was the biggest mistake I made trying to make organizational change was that belief, that mistaken belief in logic, in rationality, that that's all I needed to do. I just mm -hmm. explain it. I clearly outline the benefits that should be enough. So that's the first, the most important and I have to admit, it's a lesson I still learn today. <laughs> I still fall back on that. When really, there's now scientific evidence that shows clearly that is not how people make decisions. We do it with emotion. Yes. If you want to convince people, you have to tell them a story that will involve them emotionally. So I'm now into some of the fearless change patterns. You have to make an emotional connection. You want them to feel what you feel and you want to share your story so that they feel a part of it. And you wanna show that you care about their story, their journey and how you have something in common, how we are both alike, how we both believe something, how we have some sort of common ground, some foundation for proceeding. And that together, we may not agree, that's not the point, but together we can work it out, whatever it is, whether it's who's gonna be elected president or whether we're gonna adopt Agile or whether the team is gonna buy this new testing tool, it doesn't matter. We all have to feel like this thing fits in my story, the story my brain is telling me about the way I live my life and what I believe in and what things I think are important. And that's, that's how you reach people. It's not, not logic. So there's the most 
important lesson that I learned. That's number one. Wow. <laughs> All right, number two, number two. You cannot make big change that is sustainable. Mm. You were talking about your model, which I think is really interesting. I'm gonna to have to go look at that again. We're never gonna get there, no matter what we do mm. overnight. This is a journey we're on together and we're gonna do little tiny things because what we've got, of course, all of us are facing a complex adaptive system and you cannot change that overnight. You can only do little tiny things. They're called probes. Let's do a little tiny thing. And then we learn from that. And then we take the next little step. So here's a whole collection of patterns from fearless change that really uh, essentially map to agile development. You do something small, then you see, does that work? Is everybody happy with that? What can we learn about that? A little retrospective. And now we take the next step and of course, the answer is you'll never get there mm -hmm. because the where you think you want to go now is not where you are going to want to go next week or next month or next year, because if you learn, you keep changing. The pattern is called evolving vision. You have to have a vision. You have to have a goal. Otherwise, you won't know whether you're headed in the right direction. But you have to learn along the way and you will adapt slowly. You'll change that goal. You'll change that vision. And if you're doing it right, you should grow it just like your bamboo, which I love. You grow it together. Together, you decide all right, so far, here's what we've learned. And we're taking these little steps. And we think this is the direction, but you know, we've learned a lot. And now we think maybe we're gonna change our direction a little bit, but we all have to stay together on that. So baby steps, small change, feedback cycles, learning. You cannot, and I don't know how many times I've seen this, you cannot go into an organization and here's the CXO and, and it's always a he, by the way, so I can use he. He <laughs> says, all right, we are going to all be agile by June. Can't be done. You can't plan it out. Mm -hmm. You don't know where you'll be next June. You don't know where you're going to be tomorrow. You can just do the best you can do by taking steps of of course, you can have a goal. Of course, there are a lot of people who like spreadsheets and charts. And yes, that's okay. That's okay. As long as we realize that we might change those as we learn, we might grow those in a different direction as we see, well, these things work, these things don't work. And we don't know that at the beginning. Mm. So small steps, learn and change your vision and you'll never get there. So that's number two. Number three, and this is still hard, you're never gonna take everybody with you. Mm. I always thought, okay, I'm gonna get up, logically explain it to everybody. They're all gonna adopt this great idea and then we're all gonna to be together. Or we're all gonna have this goal. We're all gonna be agile by June. I thought we could do that. And that everybody, everybody would believe what I believe and they're all gonna make progress in the same way. When there's an enormous amount of research, a lot of it, by E.M. Rogers, who said, I don't care what it is. I don't care what domain you're talking about. I don't know whether you're looking at agile organizations or farmers in developing countries. You come in with the greatest idea ever. And you're always, always, always gonna see this response. 
some people are just going to get so excited and they're going to just jump on that bandwagon and they are going to be so easy to, con you don't have to do any cost benefit analysis. They are there. Mm -hmm. Those are the innovators, Roger says. And then there are going to be the people who are a little more hesitant. Mm, they're going to think about it, but they're open. And then you're going to have a big chunk of people, almost a third, who are going to say, well, I don't know. I'm not doing that until I see a lot of other people doing it. I'm convinced by, it's called social proof in Cialdini's influence. If everybody's doing it, okay, okay, I might, I might go along with it. And then the late majority, also a third, well, they will just fight you every step of the way because they have an investment in the way things were done and they're not going to give that up easily. Mm. And then you've got this little tiny group at the end, the laggards, and they will never go. Never. Mm. Now, there have been lots of books written about that. We already knew about it, but I didn't, you know, some at some level, I didn't believe it. I thought, no, no, my organization, we're, you know, we're with it. We are smart. We got, everybody wants to do a good job. They're going to just get on board. I mean, it take, it will take a little bit longer for some people than others, of course, but I wasn't prepared to see clear evidence of what Rogers had outlined. Mm -hmm. And I wasn't prepared for, well, how do I live with that? What, what do I do with that? And, and is this a bad thing? Because that's the first response is when you really see that, you think, well, what's wrong with those people? <laughs> you know, back to the logic thing, what's wrong with those people? Must be something wrong with them, clearly. And it's taken me a long time to develop my own story, my own metaphor, but if you really read carefully, Rogers says, this is a hardwired tendency that we have as a group. It's not that an individual is hardwired to be a laggard. You can't read some hologram in their forehead and determine, oh yeah, this guy is never gonna come on board. It's not like that. Some people are innovators in one situation and laggards in the next. But as a group, we're going to have that response. So I finally started telling myself this little story. I said, let's imagine, let's go back to the Stone Age when we were all hungry and we're sitting around in a small group and we're wondering, well, what happened to Fred and Joe? You know, well, they were here a minute ago, but now they're gone. And then all of a sudden we see him coming over the hill. Oh, here, Fred and Joe are running. And they're so happy and excited because they found some food. You know, at the time we were really hungry, except when we killed an animal of some sort and then we gorged ourselves. And so then I was hungry, ah, new berries. They have found some berries. So everybody should try these berries. Wouldn't that be a good idea? Depends on how many falls over. Anyway. <laughs> Well, it's okay. A, a few people are going to try them. Sure, they're hungry and they're going to run over the hill with Fred and Joe and they're going to try these berries. And sure, great. But those are the innovators. Yeah. The early adopters are going to say, let's wait until tomorrow. Let's see what happens to Fred and Joe and the other innovators? Let's see what kind of shape they're in tomorrow. Let's see, you know, are they standing up or are they, you know, who knows what? And if they seem to be okay, well, I don't know. I'm waiting for evidence, but I might, I might, I might try it. And then the early majority, they're not going to go until they see lots and lots of other people eating those berries. The late majority, only if they have to, if they're starving, if it means 
I'm going to die if I don't eat the berries because we haven't been able to find any food. And, you know, I'm really, I'm down to it now. It's the berries or nothing. So, yeah, if they're really pushed, okay. And the laggards, they will never eat it. I don't care. They could be dying and they will never eat the berries ever. So see how that produces an evolutionary advantage for us. That response, that level of response. You want somebody to be excited, of course. Otherwise you won't ever make any progress or do anything new, but you want some people to stand back and look at the evidence. You want some people to wait until you have enough forward movement. You want some people to say, wow, I don't know, things were working pretty well for me. If I don't have a choice, I guess I could do it. And then it's really good to have some people who don't. Because often those people will hang on to whatever was good about what you used to have. And they will make sure you don't forget some of those valuable lessons. We know that you're talking about a dynamic system. If everybody moves together in one direction, then you, that's not how you are talking about a dynamic system. You want some people who are always kind of balancing out, looking at the other side, pulling you in the other direction saying, wait a minute, there's so many studies showing that when we got too excited and we all ran off the cliff together, that was not a good thing for that population. So this pattern response is kind of like an immune system for a group. It makes sure that whatever new thing comes along that, yeah, there are going to be some people who take advantage of it, and, and that could be good. And they will lead us in that direction and some who will never go. And so what I finally came around to realizing is if you're going to be an effective organization, there are always going to be new ideas. And you always want some people to run ahead mm -hmm. and try it out and then let, us, let the rest of us know. And then we will decide on our own time how this fits, how this works for us. And we always want, always, always, always want some people who are going to say, hold it. It's healthier to have some people to say, wait a minute, what we had was working pretty well. And I know because I saw the benefits and I enjoyed whatever it was and it helped me out and, you know, for a whole host of reasons. That's good. You want people like that. You don't want to just all of a sudden as a group run off to do and then it doesn't I mean I mean I, I'm an agile fan. I have been an agile fan for 25 years, but it's good to have this response and I have learned to live with it and appreciate it. And I get a little sad when I see that most people say, let's just fire those people. Let's just get rid of them. Now that means you don't embrace diversity, really. No, no, no. You want everybody to be the same. Mm -hmm. You may talk about diversity, but no, you don't want people who don't like what you're doing or who disagree strongly. That's not an effective organization. Not really. So we need to embrace multiple points of view, different ideas about what should be done. And as part of that, we have to listen to each other. We have to really listen to understand those laggards or late majority. So this is a big lesson and sort of a big complex lesson, but it's, we're not all the same. We will never all be the same. And if we just think we can get rid of the people we don't like, and now the rest of us will be okay, 
which is a strange mentality for any group of people. We gotta find a way to live together. We have to find a way to take advantage of what everybody brings to the table. Mm -hmm. And that means you gotta really listen. You gotta really care. So there's number three. Hey, Linda, that was, I've had so many connections happening here. Um, I'm, I'm getting quite excited about this. Thank you for sharing the, those three things. Um, we just have to look uh, back as recently as 2020, when we suddenly went into some meltdown. Yeah. Uh, and um, all of those things that you have described played out in so many different guises in the public domain. We just have to look at what happened um, across the world and what type of polariz polarization, big word for me, polarization, polar <laughs> come on. <laughs> I know what you mean. It's okay. <laughs> yeah, it, 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 it was fascinating to see how this actually played out on the world stage across all nations, across all communities. It's not just in organizations. Um, it, it, it rings really, really strongly with me, what you've just shared. Yeah. I want to come In back fact, to you. Yeah. You, bring, you bring up something that's a, a really a good point, because what happened in early 2020 was we all became laggards. We all said the same thing. I don't like this change. I want to go back to the way it was. And that's what laggards say. Hmm. So we should have some empathy because typically most of us think of ourselves as innovators or early adopters. But in that moment in early 2020, everyone, 100%, everyone was saying, I don't like this, this new thing. I don't like it. I want to go back. To the way it was and that's what laggards say so we were all laggards that's fascinating and with that initial idea of we were all laggards that's where we started seeing the divergence happening about my science and your science and yeah. the, the, the 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 logical in people trying to use logic to convince um, both ways about which which perspective is is the better perspective, and that just it just <laughs> evolved into a bigger mess. Um, yeah. it, it it was doomed to, to 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 go that way because we biologically disposed predisposed to to think that way. Yeah, very so good. So I belong I belong to an organization called Braver Angels that got started in 2016. And the purpose of it is to just bring people from the two sides together, because mm -hmm. normally we don't talk to people who don't agree with us. Even within our teams or organizations, one of the patterns in fearless change is called fearless. We don't like those people. We're afraid of them. We don't talk to them. Anybody who's on the other side. Mm -hmm. So we certainly would never listen to them. We've never sit down and say, all right, tell me how you think about this. I really want to know. And with open hearted curiosity to really have a conversation with somebody who doesn't agree with you, uh, we don't do that. <laughs> that takes real courage, though. Um, and and that, that when we look at our model, courage is one of the, the things that we need to balance with with that safety it's safe to remain within my own views within my own community because that means i won't be ostracized i will still be able to eat as part of my tribe whereas yep. if i actually try something else um, it takes courage to take that risk of not being ostracized um one thing i wanted to find out from you is when you talked about um i our tendency to try and explain and over explain and prove and whatever. And you said that decision making is emotional or we, we actually make decisions based on our emotions. Um, 
How does your work align with the work from the Heath Brothers uh, switch model? I found it, I found it really um, on opener working with the switch model because it's not just here's the proof, it's the heart, the mind, and the environment. Yeah. So there are really a couple of good, very good models out there. One of them is from Daniel Kahneman, Thinking Fast and Slow. Yeah called system one and system two. System one is the big, giant, emotional, automatic, unconscious mind. And system two is the small, logical awareness or conscious part of our mind. And it maps very nicely to the model in Chip and Dan Heath's book, mm -hmm. which really is not theirs. It comes from Jonathan Haidt, who uh -huh. wrote a book called the happiness hypothesis. Nobody ever heard of Jonathan Haidt because he's a social scientist and Chip and Dan Heath are very popular uh, business book writers who have sold enormous numbers of copies. So they borrowed that model and they do give him credit. So that, that's important. And in their, in their book, they say, well, we're not gonna use system one and system two. We're gonna use the rider and the elephant. So the rider is little, tiny, mostly ineffectual. That's the conscious mind. Mm. The decisions are made by the elephant who's big and powerful. And the thing I like about Height's model that Kahneman doesn't include is the path. Mm. So in Height's model, there is the elephant is on a path. And mm. so... I, I use that metaphor in my the classes I teach because I said sometimes it's very helpful to feel when you're talking to someone to imagine that you're not talking to a logical rider, you're talking to an emotional elephant. Mm. And that changes things. The elephant likes peanuts likes to go downhill, wants to be comfortable, doesn't want to have to work too hard. <laughs> the pattern from fearless change is called easier path. Yeah. If you want the elephant to go this way, then it should be the better path for the elephant. Mm. Make it easier, make it nicer and for those... the elephant. And those small incremental changes is one of the things that makes it easier for the elephant. Yes, it, it yes. Yeah. Because sometimes the elephant's not sure. So you have to encourage the elephant. One of, in fact, the Heath brothers have a lot of patterns that map right to fearless change. Small mm. steps, you know, like, try this. You might like this. I don't know whether you're lying. I'm not, I'm not trying to force you to go, but I think you might like it. So just try it, see if this will work for you. And you have to understand what the elephant wants. Where does it want to go? Is it afraid? Don't ever spook the elephant. Don't make the elephant <laughs> reluctant. You have to be, encourage it. It's okay, it's okay. Look, you've already made a lot of progress already. So yeah, those patterns from the Heath brothers, I think they just, map right onto fearless change or they map to each other kind of i was a mathematician at one time so it's a topological mapping yeah, yeah. good <laughs> very good thank you for that linda i want to move on you talked about your evolving vision pattern and, and practice and what i wanted to find out from you is what do those organizations that's really good at practicing that evolving vision what did they have in common Ah, since there there aren't that many, I'm trying to <laughs> look look at them look at them together. My, I have I have my favorites. Yeah, of course, I have my favorites. My my favorite is Menlo Innovations. I in yeah. fact I was just there. Uh, I went to Detroit for um, an Agile and Beyond conference, and then I just I was like 40 minutes away. I drove to Ann Arbor and mm. I paid a visit to Menlo Innovations. And I think what, what makes a difference for me, I love being there. So it, it is at the top of my list. So I can just tell you that what they have is 
they know they're not perfect. Now, since they are number one on my list and I talk about them all the time and I just, and I love Rich Sheridan, of course, and I bought all his books and, you know, I think, well, they should sort of believe that they have it. They got the answers. We know how to do it because we're famous and, you know, Rich Sheridan has written about how great we are and Linda Rising has been here and she talks about us all the time, but they don't. So when you visit them and you say, well, how are you doing estimation now? Or how are you getting along with your customers? Or are you still doing that anthropology thing? And they go, well, yeah, well, we're getting better. We're learning about, you know, well, they've been doing it now for quite a while. So you would think that they would begin to believe that, well, we know the answers. We got this figured out. We know how to do it. But that's not how anybody in the organization thinks. They all believe. They all believe we're on a journey. We're getting better, but you know we've made some mistakes. Mm -hmm. And we're still learning. You go into a lot of companies, except especially big ones, and they want to tell you how they have solved their problems. Oh yeah, we had that, but now we do this. As though that's possible to solve those problems and to say, okay, let's put it in a box and we'll lock it and we'll put a label on it and we'll say, done. Mm. That's not how it works. No. The people at Menlo and there are other companies as well, they know that. You're on a journey and it never ends. You're never going to get there. It's like life. Mm. You, know, you think I'd have it figured out. At 80, but no, no, <laughs> I'm still learning. I make mistakes. I still get it wrong. And then I say, oh, no, why did I do that? And that's what we have. Mm. That's what it means to have a complex adaptive system. You don't ever have it figured out. It's constantly changing. Anything you do changes everything. So you just have to stand back and say, well, what happened here? What can I learn from that? And try to do better going forward. And so the organizations that are truly agile, that are at the top of the list, that's one thing they have in common is they all know that at a deep level they're not just saying it they mm. all have that but there's something in common there as well is is that the leaders in those settings are the ones that live that and everybody follows that that, that type of leadership behavior is a good pattern as an indicator for what you talk about uh, that evolving uh evolving vision pattern yeah, sometimes you can't tell when you're just talking to, say, the CEO, you run into him at a conference or something. I mean, he, he or she may know what to say and how to say it. But when you go into the organization and you see how they work and you see how people are, you, you can tell the difference just in, you know, say you go into a stand up meeting. You can tell mm -hmm. by the way they walk into the room and mm -hmm. how they arrange themselves for the meeting and, and just how they look at each other and how they talk about what went on. And that's when you really see, okay, here's what's going on here. Mm. You know, the leadership we, in math, we would say that would be necessary, necessary, but it's not sufficient. I think you need that leadership. It's really hard to do that without it. It's not enough. So whatever Menlo did, of course, Menlo started from the ground up. Mm. They had an advantage. Those people who were the co-founders, they believed in it. And they used that in their hiring practices. They used that in their daily work. They used that throughout. It's part of everything. But you know, most companies don't have that advantage, especially mm. a a, a large company that's been in business for a long time and you know when I started my career way back in the stone age why that's that's what you had you know the mm -hmm. IBMs the AT&T's the Bell Labs they were all big and they'd been around and they had a history that went back forever 
And they didn't have the luxury of starting over and saying, okay, here's what we're going to do. That's a very different, very different problem. Thank you, Linda. I have more questions, but I got to give Oria a chance as well. So <laughs> <laughs> thank you, Albert. That's very gracious. Um, one thing that came to mind for me is the idea of perfect. We're, we're all chasing perfection. And yet, perfect also is a verb. Perfect. Yes. Yeah. Perfect. That's Kent Beck. That's Kent Beck saying perfect is a verb. Yes. That's right, isn't it? <laughs> yeah. So, uh, wouldn't it be wonderful if more of us embrace this idea of perfecting um, rather than just chasing perfect? Yeah. Yeah. I think I think that's right, and uh, I I don't know if you know or you, you may may or may not know. I'm also a musician, and I direct a, a little group here. And at the end of rehearsals, I always say something like, "That was pretty good. Did a good job. So these were better. These are better." And they always say, "Well, wasn't it perfect?" <laughs> I say, "No, sorry." <laughs> And that's okay. That's okay. Yeah. We're not aiming for perfection. But you see, when and, it comes in, to... and in music, in music, you'll never have perfection unless you can edit it afterwards. I mean, even professionals, because this is Music City, this is Nashville, and there's a lot of live music here. And when you go into a performance, you know there are going to be mistakes. Mm. It's going to happen. It cannot be, even the symphony, we have a wonderful, wonderful symphony orchestra and I'm a big supporter. Even the symphony, they make mistakes. It's a human activity and somebody's not gonna feel good or they're gonna, their eye is gonna move to the wrong line or their finger is gonna slip off the string or something is gonna happen and it will never, now, if you're making a recording and you have a chance for somebody to go through it and edit out the little problem spots and, you know, so I always tell my groups is that we are not going to be perfect. But what we have to do is we have to recover in the moment. We have to do what we can. If Say if you get lost in the middle, here are places where you can get back in. We actually plan for it. Mm. This is really a difficult passage, but if you get lost in the middle, you will hear that cadence in measure 36, and then you'll know, ah, this is where I am, and I can get back in. You have to look ahead for that, because you know people are going to make mistakes, or they get mm -hmm. nervous in front of an audience, or it's never, it's never going to be perfect, and that's so hard for some people who feel, if I just practice if I practice, you know, my 10,000 hours, if I just practice and practice, then I will be perfect. No, no, sorry. You never will. Mm. And whether it's tennis or violin or software development, those are human activities. Then we are flawed and we are not consistent. And we make mistakes. Mm. That's the way we are. Yeah. Here's a suggestion. In terms of a performance, it's insufficient for the performance to be technically perfect. Because the performance isn't really perfect, cannot be considered perfect until there's a connection between the performer, the person that's witnessing the performance, is paying attention to the performance, and the process of connection between the people delivering the performance and the people enjoying it. That's when we have a perfect experience. It's not just, here it is, I made it perfect, but I don't care. Yep. It's not my music. Go away. <laughs> it ain't perfect. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and I guess uh, after we have a performance that <clears throat> I think the group feels better, even though they know that everybody walks out of a performance saying, I messed up in measure 16 in that Beethoven. I knew I would, and I made it, you know, I feel bad. But then they can say, but the audience loved it. 
they gave us a standing ovation. My neighbors were here at this concert and they all came up to me and said, oh, we just loved it. That was absolutely wonderful. And that's really what performers, that's what they care about. Mm. They want the audience to say, yes, ah, oh, that was just awesome. Just awesome. You and get the you response. know that you, you, you made a mistake or you messed up in, in measure 16 or whatever, but that's okay because you made that connection. You know, and at, I can say that for me as well as a musician and as a speaker that, yeah, when people come up and say, oh, we really loved your talk, you know, that's, that's what keeps me going. Mm. We certainly make quite a lot of mistakes in the, yeah, up to here with uh, with our podcast, but we're learning, and and that, that's quite <laughs> that's the journey. That's okay. Yeah, so that means you tried things, you know, and and if you regard those as a chance to learn, I mean, when when we started having online things, there I finally had to have a checklist because there's so many things I have to do in my house. I have to have certain doors open because of where the you know. You know, my husband and I could both be on a Zoom meeting and, oh, that can cause problems. So we learned if we open the closet doors to wear them you know, and I have to turn off certain things on my computer. I can't have anything else running. I have to have the blinds closed where I face. And it took me a while to actually make a list and I would forget. And so, oh, sorry, I forgot to, and I have to go open the closet door or so yeah yeah it takes you know that was a new thing and we were all experimenting and we weren't sure how this was going to work and yeah we all made mistakes and yeah and, the, and it's not like it's a new idea right in the lean community we know about standard work for at least 50 yeah. years <laughs> so, yeah. none of this none of this is new scientists have written about it, books about how they made discoveries. And they said, you know, I what I did was I just tried a whole bunch of things and none of them worked. And finally I got to one, I mean, Thomas Edison has a, a mm -hmm. quote like that, the light bulb. Yeah, I made a thousand mistakes before I figured out how to actually get that filament going the way I really wanted to. So, and he was a genius. So, you know, I, I'm so, just doing the best I can. <laughs> discipline in practice. Um, yeah. Keep going. Yes, um, exactly. Earlier on, you talked about the uh, phenomenon of the early adopters and so on. And um, uh, there's other language that people use as well in calling and talking about first followers. Um, so from an oversight perspective what do you think those functions or people can do to cultivate that first followers i think that what whatever you're trying to accomplish in your organization whether you're trying to have the agile side talk to the governance or oversight side or back in the day when i started it was the developers never talked to the testers mm. They were in a, in fact, they were on a different floor. Mm -hmm. And the, the system we were working on was so big that we couldn't compile it. So you had to have a committee of people who would compile the program. It was like 8 million lines of code. So you had the compile committee over here, and they had the testers over there, and the developers well, were someplace else. And we all pointed fingers at one another. We mm. all talked about those other people. And we, of course, we never collaborated with them or talked to them or had lunch with them. And when we started writing patterns in my organization, that came out mm. that we would be better off if we actually tried to sit down and talk to the people who do this compilation. What's it involved? Why does it take 12 people? We didn't know. Why does it take a week? Do you really have to, you know, what goes on over there? We didn't know. So to really listen and talk to those people, try to understand where they're coming from and how they see the world. So this is not a new problem, mm. it's an old problem. And we seem to be able to do it no matter who we are. 
mm-hmm. or what kind of organization we're in. And it seems to happen around the time we get about 150 people. So Menlo has been able to be successful, I think, in large part because it's small. They're not big enough so that they have to divide up. And Mm -hmm. so I don't know what you're doing and you don't know what I'm doing. And so now rumors begin to circulate and and we all kind of are in charge of certain things. We all understand what's going on. But if it's big and I really don't know what you're doing and I don't know how you think, then that's when the overhead of lack of collaboration, lack of understanding, lack of listening, That's when it has a chance to really do its work. And we as humans are so susceptible to that. It's so easy for us to blame other people. Mm. Say, well, I did my work. It must have been you people. You're the ones who are holding us up. We'd be able to be agile. We'd be able to just be so efficient and so productive. But, oh, man, you oversight people, you get in the way. So without any understanding, Nobody's listening to anybody. You certainly wouldn't want to just have coffee. Yeah. Or lunch. Do food is a powerful pattern from fearless change. Let's just have lunch together and, you know, tell me what you're struggling with. And I will really, I'll try to listen because I want to know what are you doing over there? Mm -hmm. And maybe I could help you or maybe you can help me or so simple. We just don't do it. We don't take the time because we are so sure that those people, well, they wouldn't want to do it. Well, they wouldn't want to have lunch with me. I know. I know those people. Yeah, well, you're essentially um, echoing um, anthropology, right? Um, Yes. through, through, Through the depths of history, right? It's our village. Yeah. And that village over there full of the idiots, it's they, it's them, right? right. Our village, we're virtuous, we're nice, we're Mm -hmm. we're clever, we're hardworking, we're, you know, we're we're the good guys. And those guys over there, ah, they're the problem. We (laughs) know. Yeah. It was it was Omar Sharif experiments with the Robbers Cave State Park where he showed it takes almost nothing. It takes almost nothing to get us to divide into groups. And once we've done that, to feel like we are okay and you, you're the bad guys. That's bias. Without anything, without anything at all, so much research shows that just telling us that we all like the same painting or that we all overestimated the number of nickels in a jar or some small, tiny, insignificant thing. And now we're ready to go to war because we believe that we are the good guys and you are the bad guys. Mm. And we have been living that way for tens of thousands of years. So it's not like we're gonna get rid of that. We have to do what we can to reach out and say you know i guess we are alike in some ways and you will find those if you just listen i guess we both want and and we're both trying to do and we both have some and we both and as soon as you start saying that now your brain is paying attention and thinking oh well maybe we are both on the same team here and we can work together better and we'll get along and things will be better. Mm-hmm. And of course, as soon as you do that, now you've just created another in-group and the people who are not in that group, they're all, those are bad people. <laughs> and, uh, and you yeah. start all over again. It starts <laughs> all over again. Yes. Yeah. It's constant. It's constant. It takes an enormous, it takes an mm-hmm. enormous amount of work. And if you monitor your biases, you know, after Kahneman wrote that book and he said, everybody reads thinking fast and slow because they want to be better at thinking and they want to remove or overcome their biases. And he said, I wrote the book 
and it didn't help me. Mm. I still have those biases. I still make those mistakes. Of course, these are hardwired things that at some point enabled survival. That dividing up, that kept us alive. And we did it so long. So we're never going to get rid of that. In fact, what's was most surprising about the pandemic is people always used to say, if the people on earth had a common enemy, then they would unite. They would form a team. They would be an us. Well, we had a common enemy. COVID virus mm. did not unite us. Mm-mm. It divided us. So we had a chance to see an interesting field experiment. So what people have always told us, that's not true. A common enemy may not unite us. Yeah. Well, as a matter of fact, what we're saying is it's highly likely that no common enemy will ever unite a large enough number of people. Right. Yeah. Because if it's your small community and you're attacking this small community, guess what? Mother. Well, yeah. sorry. Language here I was just to come up to. <laughs> <laughs> you're right. in trouble. We will end you. Right. So <laughs> pretty soon you get, get that exponential to um, the weapons come out and, and so on. Right? Yeah, that's right. Exactly. <laughs> so it is what it is. And I think I'm more of a stoic philosopher after the pandemic started. It is what it is. So we don't want to waste time bemoaning it. Accept it and move on, yeah. That is right. It is not within our sphere of control. Now, what we can control is on our teams and in our workplaces, we can see it. And we can recognize, ah, this is where this is coming from, because we think we're the good guys. And we think, now, wait a minute, maybe we can do something about that. It will take effort. We'll have to work at it. This is not just going to be an automatic thing. But this is just our hardwired bias at play. And it's worth the investment to be able to work together with the oversight people or the testers or the business people or the people who compile or whoever it is, is worth it to reach out and listen, try to understand. Yeah, instead we saw quite a lot of, um, at the risk of being canceled. So we saw a lot of entrenchment and a refusal to engage with different opinions during the pandemic. Uh, intentional um, the cancel culture uh, became the norm Um, so uh, it was it it played out in in many aspects people lost friends Um, you know politicians just made decisions in isolation and it it's not our finest moment in history as humanity I would would like to point out And, and it's not over yet. Yeah, I know. <laughs> it's not over yet. No. But yeah. what we hope we can do is learn. Mm. It's not that we didn't make mistakes. We did. It's not that things didn't go wrong. They did. But we should be learning as much as we can from that. Mm. And we should be collaborating as much as we can. Mm. And listening to the other side as much as we can. And identifying our own biases that takes energy takes time you and have to courage. decide whether it's worth it or not yeah and courage, that emotional investment to yes. challenge your own bias that's quite hard work <laughs> it is yeah. and because and the 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 problem is the very first step which is recognizing it mm. because our first inclination is to say i'm right my belief about this is right. Those people are wrong. Mm. And then it's not about bias. It's that those people don't get it. So getting past that to say, well, this is just my view. 
I wonder how somebody could have a different point of view and to be curious about that rather than so convinced that, all right, if you're not vaccinated, then you're stupid. I'm right. You're wrong. It's clear. And that's what holds us up right there, whether it's about vaccination or abortion or gay rights or uh, go governance or oversight or agile, it doesn't matter. It's the feeling like I'm right. Mm. I got this figured out. You are wrong. Mm. And now we're, we're dead. We can't get past that. So this leads me to another question is, is that this uh, evolutionary survival mechanism that you're talking about, um, it's a survival mechanism to believe it that. Was. Yeah, it, it, it was. was. Yeah. yeah. So my, my question around that is the systems or the complex adaptive systems that we operate in and that we work in, how much do those systems influence that um Th th those behaviors how, how much does it enforces or influences those behaviors we're talking about we know we used to have this debate that people would always say well is it nature or nurture nature, yeah. is it is it genetic or is it an environment and for almost everything there are exceptions of course some pretty serious diseases can come about because of genetics, but even in those cases. So the answer is it's both. And that's the entrance of the complex adaptive system. So here I am, I'm genetically flawed. I've been born with some propensity to have a serious illness, but my survival depends upon my environment. We know that if I get certain kinds of excellent medical care, I will live longer, I will do better, I will be happier and healthier. We didn't know that at first. We thought, no, genetics is destiny. But now we can see that environment plays an enormous part. So it's both. So you enter a complex adaptive system, you change it, those forces that are active in that complex adaptive system turn around and change you. And that has a big impact, a huge impact on your, your future, your future happiness, your future health. It's clear that people who get better healthcare, who have more money, who have more education, they do better. They live longer, they're happier. I can even see it in my retirement community. The way people live their lives determines what they're gonna be like when they're 60 or 70 or 80. Yeah, they may have had some genetic issues, of course, but it's a combination of what they were born with and what happened to them and what they did. So it's both nature and nurture. Thank you for that. And my last question, uh, Linda, before I hand back to Horia, he's, he's, jump, he's jumping at the bit here. So. Um, when we talked about the, the berries, who eats it and who refuses to eat it and so on, um, we, we talked about uh, it, you, you have to have all of those people in your organization. You have to embrace uh, having those early adopters as well as the laggards. Um, because it just helps you to maintain a healthy equilibrium and not change too fast or not change too slow. So it, it helps with that tension. So what can an oversight capability, whether you're a project manager or an executive or whatever, um, do in order to support that type of balance when it comes to change you've got the people that want to run ahead and you want to be you've got the people that don't want to run um, with that what can the oversight capability do to help maintain that balance i think everyone across the organization regardless of position or role we all have to encourage one another mm. we know we have different talents different interests different abilities. So it's like it's my, like my musical group, again, 
there are people who want to try more things, who want to play more than one instrument because mm -hmm. they think that would be interesting. There are some who say, no, I'm happy with this one. I don't want to learn another one. And you say, that's fine. You encourage them. If they only want to stick with one instrument, you, you want them to be the best they can be mm. on that one instrument. Everyone wants to be the best he or she can be. That's the job of the coach, the manager, the leader, is to make sure that everybody has the chance to be the best possible version of who they are. And whether that means that they're going to be innovative and they're always going to be looking for new things or whether it means that they want to do what they do really, really, really well. So they have some facility, they get respect for whatever contribution they make, that that should be the goal for all of us is to encourage everybody to do and be the very best of whatever it is. And that doesn't mean you have to hire to say, well, let's see, we're a little short on innovators. Maybe we should hire a few innovators. It, this is hardwired. The group will do it. Mm -hmm. And it's not like you have to have it. You will have it. And again, back to your question about environment, older, larger organizations are a little bit skewed toward the conservative end. They don't have as many innovators. They don't have as many early. They're really heavy on the late majority and laggards. New startups, small, young, well, they're heavy on the innovator, early adopter side of it. So not everybody has a nice normal bell curve. Mm -hmm. So organizations also have an impact on what that response for the population of adoption looks like. They don't all have that 16%, 16% and 235%. They don't all look like that. And in fact, nobody looks like that. Mm -hmm. The organization itself as a complex adaptive system has an impact on how people respond. And if an organization is old and it's large, its impact is to make people more conservative. It just is. So knowing about that uh, from an oversight perspective, if you work in those older organizations is to intentionally try and get the balance or the mix, mix right with uh, through recruitment potentially. We don't even know whether there is a, a right. There may not be a right. <laughs> It, it is what it is. Yeah. And yeah, it, it is what it is. And in fact, many of those larger legacy organizations have a, a sort of a different, I'm going to call it an attitude that, that those are the organizations where I spent most of my time early in my career. And most of those organizations were producing different kinds of things. We were doing communication systems, switches, 8 million lines of code for a big switch. We were riding a, a 777 airplane. Now the, the organization that develops an airplane is very different from the organization that develops web pages. Yeah. Yeah, very different. And so that organization itself that has been in that business for decades that has produced earlier, air, they're different. Mm. You started out this session by telling me what works in one organization, not necessarily going to work in another organization. That mm. is true. That is true. So we shouldn't all aspire to the normal bell curve. Maybe what works well over here in this conservative, large legacy system is not going to work over there with the, the guys who are just turning out web pages and you know a new startup with 10 people. This is a very different system mm. thank you Linda. Oh, yeah. what comes to mind for me is we talk about i am right you are wrong as if the ideas that i hold are me and the ideas that you hold are you and i'm confusing the ideas that i have today with your ideas that you seem to have or i assume you have today and I make these value judgments on the ideas, forgetting the fact that 
as I grow up, as I mature in life, I don't keep my ideas the same. Not everybody has the same belief in Santa Claus, for instance. Yeah. Yeah. You kind of change perspective a little bit as you age. As a matter of fact, you might need to kind of embody Santa Claus and provide for the sort of experience, <laughs> right? Yeah. So um, yeah. we're confusing who we are with our ideas. And this brings to me the, the miracle of agape. Um, the Greeks have this really interesting word. Um, in English, we call love, right? But love, there's all sorts of flavors of love and we don't have precision. It's like we have the joke of how men um, name colors, right? Red, green, blue, yeah? And, and women are a lot more descriptive. Um, they talk about um, coral or fuchsia or peach or, yeah, you know, more precise notations of, of color. And we need things like that for love as well because there's different flavors of love. And there's this agape form of love that the Greeks talk about. It's such a, such a miracle of connection amongst all humans across all the globe. We, we are kin. And if you look at our sort of DNA, we're 99% chimpanzee and 50% yeah. banana. And bonobo. <laughs> yeah. And bonobo. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. No, no. 50% banana. <laughs> I, I kid you not. <laughs> <laughs> We're yeah. half bananas, all of us, right? Yes, yeah. So and that, that's true for that's true for language, for words. Exactly. And even even if we are both um, living in Nashville, Tennessee, and I say a word, and I assume that you know what I meant by that word, and then when you say a word, that you assume you know what I meant, and we no, it's a miracle that we are able to have any kind of communication at all because we don't. If we really were going to dig down and look at what we really thought about those words, especially those that are value laden, like vaccine or gay or abortion, we probably wouldn't agree at all about what we're even talking about. <laughs> so, you know, to, to have some sort of a disagreement about a topic where we're not even sure what the topic is, yeah, that should give us pause. Yeah, that plays out quite regularly on LinkedIn if you if you follow <laughs> things. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. Absolutely. As it, it, it's a miracle. Yeah, it is. It's yeah. a miracle. Another thing that uh, I really love in what you were describing is this idea of making it possible for people to to shine and and grow into the best version of themselves. And yes. the thing is we don't know what that version is. And the thing is, yeah. who I can become, we often see it as constrained by who I was. And in many ways it is. But in other ways, it isn't. Because I'm only constrained by my own doubts and my own fears. If I decide today, you know what? I have these habits that are not so help helpful to me. And I will change some of my habits. I will get stronger. I will get better. I'll get more disciplined. I will invest more time in building myself up rather than tearing myself down. I will do that for the people around me as well. I will build them up rather than tear them down. Well, is that possible? Can it be done? Very much like we were discussing, some people will embrace that and some people will kind of lag and be still engaged in patterns of self-delusion and self-destruction. Yeah. And yeah. another beautiful idea that came to mind here is Words, you were talking about words, yeah? And how we're not sure what the words mean. So for instance, we have translations. Um, and in uh, the English version of, uh, of the Bible, we talk about sin. But the original word uh, is hamartia in, in the Greek, uh, ancient Greek original. And that has to do with taking aim and having a goal, setting a target and, and reaching that target. And that comes to that that goodness the better version of yourself what's your goal what, what's the better you that you want to become and if you're true to that goal then that's reaching the target but because we're psychologically so prone to to overvalue avoidance of loss to the possibility of gain 
right? We talk about sin as if it's a, it's a gruesome thing that must be avoided rather than focusing on, no, 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 no. Forget about the, the, lo the losing things. Think about the good things, the goodness, right? Frame it on the opportunity to be that awesome version of yourself in service to others, in, in good connection, communion with the people around you. Wouldn't that be wonderful? Yeah. And I think it's where I feel like I've been very lucky that I haven't spent my entire career, even on into retirement, at the same organization. Mm -hmm. Because you can tell there is a difference. I have experienced that myself personally, working as a full-time employee in different organizations. And I know how I felt and I know what I was able to do. And I know how I was able to learn and grow in some places and not in others. I know what an impact that organization had on me. And now that I'm a consultant, I get to see a lot of organizations and I can see the difference in what happens in those organizations, how the people feel. And when you use words in those organizations like purpose, and safety, and in some organizations, they know what you're talking about, and in others, they also know because they don't have it. Mm. So what an impact organizations can make because we are flawed and we are often stuck in the past. We are often feeling like, well, there's a ceiling on my capabilities. When in some organizations, you're encouraged to be better and you find that you can, you can be better. So what a difference. Wouldn't it, wouldn't that be a goal for all of us to do what we can mm -hmm. to make sure that as many people as possible have that experience of being in a place where there is no ceiling, where they have safety where they can show courage what what an awesome goal to do that yeah. for as many people as we can as long as we can i, I i'll sign up for that <laughs> <laughs> that's awesome yeah that's awesome and immediately what that triggers to me oh hold on a second ego will worm its little tail in and say oh no 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 i can't allow mary to um to look better than me i can't allow john to to do better than me i will fit, find a way to undermine her or him because you know there's this kind of tall poppy thing or the the nail that sticks out will be smacked down you're like come on come on come on not so fast don't get so good and mm. we think are you a good friend by trying to pull me back or are you a good friend by cheering up for me and and, and wishing me better so we're talking about fixed versus growth mindset now mm. And all the evidence, all the experiments that are, have been done with children or sports teams or business organizations all show that when you believe the talent or ability, yes, of course, it's influenced by what you have, but it's also influenced by whether or not you believe in growth. And when we all believe that, then that competition, that idea of sabotage, that idea that, well, you can't get ahead of me, it goes away. That that's also a factor in the organization that allows safety and courage is to encourage the growth mindset that we all believe that, that yes, we have different talents. Yes, we were, we're I, I, I will never be, I, I'm a musician, but I know that I'm never gonna be a great composer director but I'm better now than I was 10 years ago mm. I believe I can get better and so can you that that growth attitude has an impact in an organization and on a team as well especially among managers if they believe that I can encourage people and they can grow and they can get better rather than seeing my job as labeling well, who's got it and who isn't? And let's see if we can fire the lower 10%. That's very fixed mindset. Those organizations do better. 
So there's plenty of evidence for that. Growth, believe in growth, believe in improvement. This has always um, been magical for me. It's, it's, it's mysterious. Hope, right? Yes. It, it is yes. Such, a, such a baffling concept, hope. Because on the surface, you could say, well, nature is red in tooth and claw. Uh, we never get out of it alive. I mean, why bother, right? You get the, the nihilist uh, view of the universe. Uh, life has no meaning. It's useless. Let's forget it. Let's all commit seppuku and kind of just buy a gruesome <laughs> death right now, right? Maybe tomorrow. Um, not today. <laughs> yeah, well, no, no, that's one way of thinking, <laughs> right? But equally yeah. so, we could dream, hold on a second. We have this opportunity. Wow. There's a possibility of community, of joy, of union, of harmony with each other. We can actually be awesome together. Yep. We can be fantastic. We could be custodians. We could protect those that cannot protect themselves. We could look after nature really nicely. We could live in beautiful harmony with it, as opposed to seeing ourselves through a lens of I don't know, resentment or, or, or something like that. But that requires hope. That requires this ephemeral belief that good and better exist and they can be reached. And, and some of it, with some effort, can be attained. But that requires some determination, some focus, some discipline, some sort of uh, stick to itness to actually grit, maybe, as Angela uh, Duckworth puts it. Yeah. And some people will say, oh, no, that's been debunked. They're like, yeah, 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 yeah. Okay, we've talked about the, the sort of bell curve and, and so on. Sure, right? There will have to be resistors. And there will be people that have different sort of psychological tendencies. That's wonderful. But I wonder, right? Yeah. What can humanity become? How may we develop into a better form of ourselves? How can we draw on more of this hope for a better um, more loving, more connecting, more empathetic future. How can we better engage with with one another? What What do you think? What What should we dream? Wow, you're giving me the tough question. I mean, <laughs> wow. So I I mentioned earlier that when the pandemic hit, I'd been spending more time outside because I'm I'm definitely a believer in exercise, and that I found well I couldn't go to the gym anymore. So what am I going to do? And my husband realized that it, here we live in this retirement community and we chose it because it has miles and miles and miles of hiking trails through the forest. And I said, we, you know, we never go out there. We always go to the gym every day, but we don't go out into to the forest. So we should start walking. Mm -hmm. And when we did, I thought, well, here are all these trees. We see animals. We got deer. We have wild turkey. We have hawks, we have eagles, we have all kinds of birds and animals and trees. And I, I don't really know a whole lot about trees. There was a, a new book that came out in 2020 by Suzanne Simard called Finding the Mother Tree. And so I read the book thinking, well, I should learn some, something about these trees. And the essence of what her research is about, because she's a PhD forester, she showed in her experiments that all the trees are connected underground, not through their roots, but through another organism, a fungus, a particular kind of fungus. And that using this fungus, they can help each other. They collaborate. If one tree is in trouble and it needs a certain kind of mineral, I say we're short on magnesium, the other trees will sort of muscle around and say, well, we can send you some magnesium. They help each other out, especially the young ones. When they're first starting out, the young trees, they struggle because now they're not in the sun, they're, they're covered up by all the older trees, they're in shade. And so now the older trees help the younger trees. And since they're all connected, they can communicate what they need and how healthy they are and whether they need help or not. But some of the trees are more connected than others. And those are called the mother trees. In fact, some of the mother trees are connected to almost every tree in the area. 
some as many as many, many miles away. So when I read about this amazing connection, I thought, well, you know, that's kind of what we have. We have connections, even though we can't get together. We have the ability to at least electronically connect with one another. Mm. And that that suddenly spoke to me as, well, maybe that's my role now. I'm a mother tree. I'm connected to lots and lots of people, especially, and since I'm incredibly old, these are all younger people. <laughs> These are all younger, so I can help them. Well, I will do that as long as I can. Mm. But what happens someday, it's going to happen when I can't do that anymore. And what this book gave me was hope. Because it led me to Nature Conservancy and the Tennessee Conservation Organization that runs a green burial site. And when I die, I am not gonna be embalmed. I am not gonna be cremated. I'm gonna be wrapped in a linen cloth and I'm gonna be put into the ground and I am going to become a tree. Wow. I think I will be a red maple. I haven't decided. But I got from that book and that feeling of being with the trees, a sense of hope. It's very difficult to grow old and to think that you're not gonna be around much longer. So if I have hope because of what I learned about being connected and that that connection can even continue in a different form, I'm not talking about God or heaven. I'm talking about continuing to nurture, continuing to help, to do what I can. That gave me hope. I offer that to you. Wow, that's powerful, and I thank you. Um, I don't want a moment to. I don't want the moment to pass. So that that was quite um, inspiring. Thank you, Maria. Thank you. Um, um, words failed me in in expressing gratitude for this beautiful moment. Um, it's it's just a one of those perfect moments that we were just describing earlier right when the the person conveying wow. it and the people that it, that it lands on just just strikes the the right note i'm hopeful good good i'm glad you're hopeful yeah i am i am i'm hopeful that it'll resonate with a lot more people as well yeah. it, it, it oh, sure yeah. has has had a profound impact on me you can hear it in in my voice it's 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 very powerful. Yeah, um, I'm glad. Linda, thank you for the nurturing. Uh, we really appreciate that, and thank you for everything you're doing for the community that that you that you described. And it was such an honor having you uh, on here with us today. It was uh, my pleasure. Thank you for inviting me. You keep me going. <laughs> Thank All right. You, what didn't we ask you that we should have? I think we pretty much covered it when we were talking about being buried and, and nursing <laughs> future. I think I think we've done it. I think we covered everything. We Sweet. did it. We did a good job. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. No, I wouldn't have dreamed of asking anything like that. I'll tell you that. <laughs> but it, it it was absolutely magnificent. Yeah. Well. Well done. Yeah. Thank, Thank you. you guys. Thanks. Thanks for all you do. Thank you. Good luck. Yeah. You. So <laughs> we want to leave it on that note for today. Uh, thank you for listening. I'm Aldo. And I'm Horia. And again, thank you, Linda. My pleasure. Thank you, guys. <laughs>